Okay, next we have Joe Connelly with Project Arcana. Joe, over to yep. you. Thank you very much. Uh, so the, the full title of my talk is, is fairly ostentatious. I'll read it to you. It says, All Yesterday's Tomorrow's, the report on and of Project Arcana concerning word processing, electronic publishing, hypertext, etc. The, the t actual title is inspired by another title, uh, the title of the book called Literary Machines by Ted Nelson, which is even more ostentatious than this, and that's what the yes, etc. stands for. So. Uh, what's Arcana? Arcana is a free open hypertext system written in Emacs list with common list extensions. So, you know, why do we need another one? Actually, the, the previous talk was a great setup for my talk because what I'm talking about is, is actually fairly different in an almost orthogonal, maybe, you know, 80 degrees kind of way. So, um, <clears throat> um, so but it, it, it is nevertheless a hypertext system. Although, basically, for my talk, I'm going to actually do a Sort of a traditional talk with slides, although they're in a web browser, and um, then I'll try to show you a demo. So let me first give you some background. So this is a talk about code that I was working on before I started a PhD project. I'm now three years into my PhD project plus, and I haven't worked on the code. So I went back and ran the code. I had kind of two different prototypes, one from 2005, one from 2009. I ran the one from 2005, and it worked. So this is the first thing I want to say, which is that Emacs, unlike, say, socket I.O., if you run some legacy code, it typically works. So that's a little background. I'm talking not just about the programming, because I haven't been doing a lot of it. This isn't, you know, cutting-edge code. This is a bit legacy, but I'm also going to talk a bit about the project management aspects of that, such as it was, and the high-level goals. Um, but if you're at all familiar with Ted Nelson and Xanadu, this is an idea that goes back to, like, 1963. I don't remember how that fits in with the... Uh, history of Emacs, but like before there, there was a web, there was this thing called Xanadu. And I'm going to not talk about Xanadu, I'm going to talk about Arcana. What's going on here? Keeping it. Okay, so it just factors of information into documents in a, in a holographic kind of fashion. You get this from here, you get that from there, you assemble it. You know, kind of the, the federated peer-to-peer -peer stuff we were just getting to talk about is the sort of thing that would be the everyday occurrence in this kind of system. So. You know, you build things up from scratch, but you also look for the kind of emergent patterns that occur. So it, it's not just that things come from um, assembling in this hierarchical fashion, but they're actually graphs and networks, and they reconfigure themselves in a, in a very lively way. Um, so over the years, just to give you a sense of, of, of what we're doing, what we've been doing, we built quite a few things. It, it started in uh, 2000 and Three or so, I was in a different PhD program studying pure math, and that, that didn't work out because I got interested in artificial intelligence for mathematics. So some of these early spin-off prototype things were like, how do you represent mathematics in LISP? Um, things like that. Um, and so I didn't call it Arcana at that time. It was just messing around with stuff. But indeed, the, the mathematics applications of this kind of thing are relevant. So, um, since 2003 or 2004, I've been involved with planetmath.org. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a wiki for mathematics, basically. So, you know, um, things like this, I was interested in how could you improve it. Okay, so, so this is sort of the background. Uh, but let me explain what the system is. The defining features of the implementation are some low-level functions that you allow you to create a network of texts, whatever that means. Uh, a browser to navigate this graph because we're very much thinking of things in a graphical way and functions that assemble documents out of the graph. So if you were on Planet Math and you had, say, a list of problems um, and you wanted to assemble those problems into a course packet and you wanted to have the relevant material so you could understand what the problem said, this was kind of my application that I had in mind from 2003. And I think we're getting fairly close to being able to implement that um, just in Planet Math without Arcana. But the Arcana thing should allow you to edit this document and put all the pieces back in their place. So um, that's kind of what it does. Um, you could use different backends to store these pieces. So um, in my different prototypes, I had one that was completely Emacs based. That was the 2005 version, which is still sort of the best and most demoable version of the code. Um, the 2009 version used uh, common list, and I'll show you that as a back end, and I use common list to communicate to a database. There's probably an Emacs way to do that 
by now, or maybe there was already a great Emacs interface to a database that I bypassed. But I used CLSQL to communicate to a database, but why not communicate to other things and just store your stuff wherever? Um, and like I said, the front end uh, allows you to, you know, pull it all into Emacs, edit it, and have things go back where you where you put it in the first place. So um, I'm just repeating myself so you guys get the basic concept. Um, and Emacs is actually quite a nat natural way to do that because you need to know a lot about where what you're working with comes from and where it needs to go. And you can't just edit plain text. And of course, Emacs doesn't just really edit plain text. It, it, there's a lot more richness to a buffer than that. Um, but you know, once you have all these bits of text flying around in and out of repositories and web pages and databases and stuff, you might as well throw some stuff in the middle and process it while it's on the way. So one of the applications that me and particularly my collaborator, Ray, um, is interested in here is proof checking. So again, you know, I thought, well, why don't we, why don't we assemble nice, comprehensible uh, <clears throat> you know, course packets? Well, comprehensible, sure, if they're comprehensible to me, that's great. But what if they were comprehensible to a machine? Um, you know, and so the machine could study these course packets and, say, pass mathematics exam then I wouldn't have to. I could go to the beach, finally. Um, you know, so, um, so this is the kind of thing that we were thinking about. Um, and you know, in my PhD, I haven't been working on Arcana, or I use Emacs every day, but I haven't been working on really writing Emacs stuff. I've been working on building Planet Math, so we've rebuilt Planet Math. Um, I'll show you after. I've got a kind of web browser demo section and then an Emacs section. But we've rebuilt Planet Math so that it's um, serving MathML, which means that all of the math is actually parsed for us, and we have parsed trees for the stuff. So it's giving us some nice things to think about. Um, there's also, we've rewritten Planet Math so that it works in Drupal, and um, there's a Drupal services module that should allow us to connect, just like you were seeing, editing the Emacs wiki from Emacs, to be able to edit Planet Math from Emacs, although it's living in Drupal instead of in Emacs, but anyway. Um, so that, that's an optimistic kind of relatively soon now kind of thing. It doesn't really deal with all these fancy features. But kind of the, the long run, the more interesting thing in a way for more people, because after all, math is sort of a specialist topic, is actually programming, because more people here probably do programming than do mathematics. Um, but what's interesting is kind of a, a style of programming that we've heard quite a bit about in the, in the previous talk litter programming style where the code mixes with the documentation. Um, it's, getting, it's getting easier and easier to learn how to program. Um, you know, you can do cool stuff right out of the box, whatever. So, so this is the kind of vehicle for the idea. Why Lisp? Well, Lisp is quite cool. Lisp allows you to build tree structures. You know, every Lisp thing is a tree. You don't need that to be explained to you. What we're doing here adds a layer of kind of interest and complexity because instead of just having trees, you actually everything is a graph. So instead of just having a car and a cutter, you've got a beginning, a middle, and an end, which allows you to associate things with each other. You have bi-directional links between things. And roughly speaking, um, you know where stuff comes from. So every object has a bit of a a bit of a history and a bit more structure than you would know about in list. Furthermore, these aren't normal graphs. I should also mention that these graphs allow you to also point at edges. So you can point from an edge to another edge or, or whatever. Um, things stick together in, in a slightly more complex way, allowing you to build, basically allowing you to build structures like the ones that you naturally visualize when you draw pictures or schematics. So, um, oops, I talked much. So, anyway, like I said, pretty much every object system is annotatable. Um, this is one of our biggest strengths but maybe the biggest weakness as well, because even defining what that means probably cost me two or three years of feeling like I was going crazy to think about what it means for everything to be annotatable. What does it even need to be a thing? And this kind of is, you know, there's a whole field of philosophy called ontology. You get a bit sick of this kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, so let's say with some approximation, everything's annotatable, um, and that's nice, you know. You want things to be annotatable, uh, you know, for all sorts of reasons. Say for social justice reasons that you want to be able to say this thing is bad, and you want everyone to know that you think it's bad. And since not everyone agrees with you, they come along and they say you're bad or whatever. So 
you know, you want these things to happen, and, and, and then you still want to be able to walk away at the end of the day. So this is instead of necessarily hard modification. So uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had people working? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I was going to say that from a project development standpoint, I, was, I had a job that really allowed me to do whatever I felt like for a period of time. I'm not in the job. It just paid the bills. But, you know, so I worked on this in my kind of uh, attic for for some years and worked on other planet math things for some years quite a bit, but didn't really reach out to other people. So like being in front of a big audience like this is really a treat. Um, kind of polish up the code from 2005 and 2009 and say, yeah, it still works. Um, so wouldn't it be nice to connect with some of you all if you're interested? And maybe you'll be more interested if I stop talking and show you the code in a minute. But let me just say that we presented works in progress at LISP New York. Um, we have some colleagues at this place in Germany where I just came from this morning who work on knowledge representation and reasoning about mathematics content typically. So we already have some kind of network of people who are working with the Planet Math folks, um, and you could join this little community and contribute to it in whatever way you like. But this is one thing. Um, I've also in the past been involved a bit, a little bit with Etherpad. Uh, we use ShareJS on Planet Math for a real-time editing experience that's kind of like Etherpad. Um, the code is a little easier to hack and a little cleaner, as I understand. Um, and one of the things I did at one time was to try to write an Emacs client for Etherpad, which doesn't really work, but it provides a proof of concept that you could do such a thing. You can send things and get them back. Um, uh, Sasha showed Rudel. I was sitting with the guy who wrote Rudel, hacking and hacking for three days, and we were trying to decompile Etherpad and really big headache, and I think we got our first proof of concept. And like some of these other, other prototypes, it's one of these things where I think you use the ideas more than you use the code, really. I mean, you, you get something out of it that you can use. So um, hopefully, not in the too distant future, we will have a nice real-time editing thing syncing to the web using probably ShareJS this time, unless Etherpad also ends up using ShareJS or something like that. So um, this isn't necessarily part of Arcana, but it would be something that would fit in nicely. Um, let me talk a little bit more about what the thing means philosophically or whatever. So linking is how Scully are attached to other articles. Um, so Scully is just a piece of text that's connected to another piece of text. And the collection of all articles is somehow the commons, like Planet Math is a commons. And then there are some rules for interacting with this commons that defines the commons management system. So, you know, you, on Planet Math, things are owned. And you guys were just talking about on Emacs, wiki, what if things are owned instead of being this free-for-all, and even if things are free-for-all, you can't put spam or porn there, so, you know, what are the rules, and, and how, how are those encoded in this system? Um, I mentioned my 2009 prototype, I'll just say a little bit more about it, that we connected Emacs to common list via Slime, and then common list connected, I used PostgreSQL, uh, and I tried integrating a free text, uh, text-based search engine. I think that all kind of worked in 2009. But this is one of these times when I was trying to sort out what does it mean for everything to be annotatable. And I, I had some big headaches trying to think of do we need triples or do we maybe need quadruples or perhaps quintuples. And you know, if I want to reference an object, what is that object? And everything was sitting inside this relational database, which is fine. But that meant everything had to have an ID. And so what is the thing really? You know, I was having a lot of headaches with that. And I, I, I think. Uh, it's interesting, right now we've kind of simplified drastically. Things are these triples, like I've said, and, and the triples can point to other triples or other pieces of triples, and that's nice. It's, it's a bit less of a headache. Um, it's a bit more formal, and the, the new way is to write everything in a modular fashion so that, that we have a back end that has a few functions, and if you impl implement these functions, it doesn't matter whether the stuff is sitting in a triple store or in the web or in some combination and so forth. So, we're kind of taking, we've moved back to baby steps and uh, this proof of concept implementation where you connect to common list has some cool things. I'll show you a couple snippets of code. So I mentioned Xanadu at the very start, kind of the giveaway. Arcana is, a, is another one of these joke names. It's our Xanadu, our, our, our version of this free open web where everything's editable and everything's derived in this kind of massively nonlinear way. And you should read Ted Nelson's book. I want to put a plug out for it. I think his political practices have been kind of, you know, bizarre to say the least. He's tried to build a kind of free as in freedom system that isn't free as in beer, and then he goes around suing everybody. I don't know. I don't even know the whole story, but um, basically Xanadu has a curse, and you can read about it in Wired, 
So that's why we're not trying to implement Xanadu. We're implementing Arcana. It's different. Don't sue me, you know. Um, so uh, I would also say that, you know, there's been a lot of thought that's gone into this, um, you know, a lot of reading and so forth. And like I said, there's the kind of ontology aspects. Um, you know, during these times when I was getting so stressed, thinking, you know, gosh, we need triples or quintuples, you know, I should have been reading my Wittgenstein a little bit more. He said, you know, it should be possible to decide a priori whether, for example, I can get into a situation which, in which I need to symbolize with a sign of a 27-termed relation. But he was speaking ironically, and, you know, the point is, you know, uh, it should depend on the application. And so as soon as you have a real application, these things kind of quickly fall into order. And, and trying to decide in advance what this kind of uber hypertext is supposed to be. I mean, people already invented relational databases, so, like, don't stress your brain, I tell my younger self. Um, okay, so, um, so this sounds nice. So how do you deal with content that isn't authored in Arcana? Because, after all, nothing, well, very little is authored in Arcana. The Arcana itself, of course, is authored in Arcana um, as, as literate programs, although as I was recompiling things, I noticed some infelicities in that implementation that, that sort of say that Arcana itself is not complete yet. But anyway, what about things like Amazon or things like things on Kindles or whatever, things that are locked up behind non-free non protocols where you can't, say, get a feed off of it? Because Emacs Wiki sounds great. We could just represent everything in these triples, and then we could do inference about it and mash it up with Planet Math, and we'd have a gay old time. But, you know... Um, what about things that are that are locked up? Well, uh, in my perspective, something that's completely locked up is like a brick, and you can still put comments on a brick, and then you can take the brick and you can throw it through someone. So you know, um, so basically, every table system, whether it has to do with internal structure and content and so forth, and you could say this is a brick, it's stupid, or whatever. Um, so looking back over the project from the project management point of view, uh, like my life story is also told in Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. And maybe you, if you've read the book, you remember that the pseudo protagonist got into working on programming when he was trying to create a text editor to edit his English papers. Oh, oops. So kind of one distraction leads to another. And, uh, and in a sense, you know, this arcana and even this, this talk is a bit of a distraction. But this is the nature of things. This is the nature of hypertext. And this is actually the kind of nature of the system that we're working with. This is why we have not just links like a href equals blah, but we've got that middle. Because that middle where you get distracted and interesting things happen is what's interesting. That's where emergence happens. That's where externalities exist. And that's where things get messy and get cool. Um, I guess one other thing I would say here is, you know, why hypertext? Forget about why list. Why hypertext? It's because, you know, people aren't all connected in the same place. You know, I've just met some people like Sasha who I've known for a few years online, but, you know, quite exciting to meet in person and see everyone who's very excited and they're all going to go home and then how will we communicate? Um, so long, long run, um, some cool things are happening in the P2P space these days. Uh, like Namecoin, I don't know if you guys ever heard of Namecoin, you probably heard of Bitcoin, but Namecoin is like Bitcoin for URLs, and they get a little packet of information attached to themselves, so uh, I don't know enough about Namecoin to say with authority that we will use it, but it would be quite cool to be able to assemble these things out of lots of little snippets and maybe pay someone some micropayments to get back to Ted Nelson's idea of paying for things. Um, anyway, so yes. There was probably a non-trivial chance of going crazy when working on the system, um, but we weren't worried about that. I think we were more worried about going sane when working on the system, so we allowed ourselves to be crazy. Um, and we created a lot of obscure documents, which you can read, uh, that describe our thinking about mathematics and wikis and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's still there. It's in, uh, it's in the same odd news wiki, so maybe we'll one day pour that bizarre content into the new Emacs wiki and have fun with it there. Um, I will just say that if we manage to implement some of the stuff that I'm blathering to you about, and we'll try to show you in a minute a little bit about, uh, but I'm trying to speak conceptually because there is kind of a vision here that I can't just show you today, we will potentially have something like what I called the hyperreal dictionary of mathematics, um, which was like this giant mathematics dictionary that included all mathematics, and it was all proof checked, and it made it all very easy to read. So, you know, you could read it in like an afternoon and then go to the beach in the evening and so on. So um, 
But even if we don't get the artificial intelligence stuff, having some cool co-editing, co-presence, math, mud, would be really cool for like a planet math 3.0. So, you know, maybe next decade, next time you try to learn some mathematics, you'll see, oh, hey, there's all these friends online and we're chatting and so forth. So, um, so that'd be pretty cool even without the AI part. Um, here's my long, super text heavy slide. Gosh, it won't even fit. Oh, it just does. Um, so there's lots of inspirations for this. There's a long legacy of things from the AI space and from the mathematics space that kind of ins inspire both the code and the formal side. And the idea is that, you know, code and content are kind of similar. And so, you know, you can go every everywhere from Deleuze to Groth and Deke and back. And, you know, it's really quite fun. Um, and so, you know, you know, I take pretty seriously, we do stand on the shoulders of some giants here. Um, so here's the last thing. So, hello world, this document is readable and editable within Arcana, so I'm lying. It's not really, um, but it will be soon. Um, as, as is the system itself, um, we've got code online as of yesterday, and there's even a mailing list set up, which has been in existence from 2005, so needless to say, it's fairly low traffic at this point. Um, but you will get commit messages from this thing, and this thing, just to kind of, you know, um, put our money where our mouth is, it's set up with a mob branch, which means you can be anonymous and you can push code into our repository without ever telling us who you are. Um, and we'll probably use it because, you know, we're desperate. Uh, no. uh, uh, but we will use it under the Afero GNU GPL, um, partly to make Richard Stallman happy and partly because um, it makes us happy to make Richard Stallman happy. Um, there's a Lisp icon and a GNU here because we, we do actually use some common lists. So let me show you, um, can you, yeah, in the front row you might be able to see that. So oops, not if it's zoomed in. So in the front row you can kind of see a, a, a diagram of a mathematics, uh, a mathematical structure that's written in this language. So you can see what I was talking about with links pointing to other links. Um, this represents some, some inference rules. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail because I don't actually understand the example myself. This came from Ray, but... You know, in any case, I do understand the model of links pointing to links. Um, why do you want that? Well, you want to be able to reason about reasoning. You know, you need to be able to understand what these steps are. And you, you need to be able to say, that's wrong. I wanted to do it a different way. Or you want to be able to plug something into that step and make it procedural. So, um, yep, it really is there. There's a repo. You can clone it. Um, here's the crazy... Uh, stuff I was talking about from, from Legacy. Here's Planet Math in, in February two, uh, 2013. We relaunched it, and um, like I said, everything is in uh, MathML, so if you want this, there's a nice structure there. Okay, so enough of the show and tell. Let me try to show you at least briefly. Oh, I'm going to show you a little bit of a um, yeah, an inspiration. So I don't know who's used all, but you can't necessarily use Arcana a whole lot right now. Um, but you can use all mode. And all mode is great. It's like occur, but you can edit the things that you occur. So, you know, you you occur it and you go, yep, it's cool. So, um, so Arcana is kind of like all mode, but for more than just one buffer at a time. It's for, like, the entire web. Um, I want to do something else. So... With that little quick foray into the thing, let me show you. You guys want to see some short source code. So here's the source code. Um, it looks more like a paper because I was really feeling extremely verbose at that time, it looks like, when I was working on it. But if you dig down deep buried in here, I mean, there's a lot of theoretical background. So, but eventually, oh, come on. Eventually, it, well, it's because of the font is so big, but anyway. Okay, here we go. Into it. So there we go. Um, so, you know, there's some, there's some list preliminaries, and you kind of define all these things inside of, inside of a LaTeX document, and, and when you run it, you just strip out the LaTeX, and you run the list, and that's just your basic literate programming kind of 1.0 thing. Um, and so here it is. There really is lots of list code, and there it is, and, and I wrote... Uh, a couple versions of this, which I'll why I show you two different ones. Well, they're not so they're not so different. This is the one with the um, common list. So we had uploaded it to common list. That's pretty expired, but 
Um, let me show you the two. So if there is two points, um, no. Mm. Latex. No. Oh. The two pieces of code. So these are two pieces of code, and, and if I have two kind of take home points for you about Emacs and about Lisp, well, they're more about Emacs. Um, the first one is from the, the 2005 thing. So, so we had to mark things up, and I'll show you this. It, it's hard with this small screen, but um, we had to mark things up with text properties. So I was telling you, we want to route things back in and out. So this is how we do it. We encode all that kind of meta information as text properties. And this is how you do it, because, in fact, you encode everything on one text property, and it's called the skull property. So this was interesting. I had to think about it. I had to ask some questions about it. Why don't you have many different text properties to show where many different things are encoded? Well, you need to be able to grab them efficiently, and you don't want to mess too much with Emacs' own text property thing. So that was a important learning experience, which was to add one text property that encodes all of my all of my properties. Um, okay, fair enough. So you the value. Oh, oh, there it is. So you add the value. Okay, so here is the second one from that, that second implementation. So this is Emacs Lisp code uh, that implements a macro that allows me to send code to common Lisp. So that second PDF I waved before your um, is sent. It includes a lot of common Lisp code uh, that why do I send it to e back and forth to common Lisp? Well, I'm, I'm trying to do my sort of data stuff on the common Lisp side, and I want the results back on the Emacs side. So I at least need to be able to send those things over. But in fact, in the common Lisp part is where I implemented a lot of the reasoning. So this basically just allows me to treat Emacs as a front end to common Lisp. It's not that filling, but it's one of the more interesting little bits of Emacs code I've ever written. If anyone was going to rewrite this, it's not really a full implementation of the defun macro, so someone could rewrite this better and that would be nice, but it's a, it's a cool thing. Okay, so let me show you, this is, this is a preview so, so of what I will show you in just a second. So, um, so basically, this is the mode, um, you know, and, and one of the ways it's broken is I'm just editing one of the articles, right? Um, and this, so one of the ways it's broken is uh, if I edit this, and press save. I can save it, uh, but not back into the LaTeX yet. So that that's kind of useless. So I mean, I I can read things out of the LaTeX. I I can't just like say save it back into the LaTeX, which is the obvious thing to do. But having realized that that was important, you know, I can probably implement that not too bad. And it's not bad because what what these things are. Is these are these associations I was talking about with the uh, with the uh, text property. So here's this little list, list browser. If you remember that I said the first implementation, the first kind of prototype was this iPod-like list browsing thing. Um, here it is. You know, so you have this thing, and you can see what links there, and you can follow these links around as if you were in Emacs W3M or Info or Help or whatever. And there they are, and you can see here who links to you, because the links are in some sense bidirectional, although this is just the Emacs version, no common Lisp, no smoke and mirrors, you know. Um, so if you had better links, you could do more with them. Um, but, but in any case, you get enough to know uh, who links here. And then if I want to create a, a, a scolium, attach some kind of comment, um, you make uh, uh, so it pops up something sort of like Emacs slash W3M. I think I got that right. Yeah, you know, the Emacs web browser before the one that we saw that was actually a web browser there was this thing. Um, and uh, so if you were editing fields, you see something kind of like this. because then you just type control C, control C, and your passage is marked up with this little note. So this little note becomes a marginal note, 
And because it's a hypertext, if I want to go there, that now is a node in the system, and I can get that as well. And I could go back, and you've sort of implemented the kind of web browser type thing, because I can go back in a temporal thing, or I can navigate it spatially and so forth. And of course, I can continue to make a scolium like this um, more. And so, yes, indeed. Um, so, so that's kind of cool, anyway. It would be cooler if you could save it all back into the LaTeX document. Um, but this gives you a sense of what is going on in the system. And why is it relevant? Well, go back to the plan of math case, and you want to annotate and say, this passage contains a such and such reasoning steps, the such and such heuristics, or watch out, this part's difficult, or I got stuck here. And you want people to know about that. You know, so, so you want, of course, you have to get them to know about that through HTML and XML and all this kind of crap, but um, but if you're editing in Emacs, it makes it a little bit easier. So that's that. Now, um, if I can just show you what I, what my kind of breakthrough moment was when, you know, I was editing the source code of this thing, and this is what it looks like here, and this is where those things should be routed back in. But I, I had this kind of muscle memory that said, uh, if I look for save excursion and press evaluate, I'll get my system. And so that, I thought that was quite good, but that even though I hadn't really worked on this from 2005, the code still works to the level at which it works, even at this point in, the, in, the, in history. So it needs some cl cleaning up. I'm you know, nearly finished with my PhD and undistracted, ready to connect this thing to Planet Math. Um, so I'll probably be working on this some more. I hope to see some of you, you know, say hi on the list or commit something or you know, do something. Um, but no pressure, whatever. I'm um, happy to answer questions now. Hi. Sorry, I, I missed the first three minutes I, of the talk. I, I was I just going to rewind back to the first slide, so okay. Oh, great. So I hope my, my answer is not wrong. Um, did you consider interfacing with... Um, Things like formal proof theory. But are you aware of formal proof theory? Formal um, proof theory. Okay. Uh, because instead of interfacing to human written text documents. Oh, I understand. Uh, yeah, the like, mechanized mathematics. Like Cock or HTML. Yeah, exactly. Or what the have there. Because uh, so not only did we consider interfacing to such things, we considered writing these things. And that, that was my second slide, so you might have missed oh. it. Um, Let's see, this representation true. language for mathematics. So here's a page on planetmath.org which describes the semantics of mathematical writing. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of, oh, there's more of my preface stuff, sorry. Uh, in terms of 100 examples, so what is a residual space? It's a topological space. Uh, well, you have, no, it's a thing where you have a topological space, and A is a subset of the topological space. It's of second category, and this other bit in here is of first category. That's what it says in list. Of course, you could say the same thing in HOL, or you could perhaps parse your HOL into Lisp or whatever. But yeah, because in any case, there's lots of these things which exist. Um, we have considered it quite extensively. We haven't done it, but this thing, which I wrote in 2003, is, uh, is what I was thinking, that we would want to do that very much. We would want to read that, and we want to be able to reason about those existing things. But because those existing things use different kinds of mathematical foundations, we, of course, want to be more general, and we want to be able to read all of them and not just be stuck in HOL or COC or what have you. Um, and, and ideally, we'd be able to read the natural language as well. But this is a very good start to read these languages, I agree, um, and, and parse them into this. So, you know, yeah, I think this is, this is the classic example. What's a measure space? Or what's, what's something a measure zero? Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's actually easier to read in Lisp, I think. So, um, but, yes. But anyway. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think the answer is yes, we have considered that. Yeah, the reason of my question, if I'm allowed a little remark, is because they're both based on lambda calculus, which is the you know, infrastructure of Lisp, uh, Scheme, Racket, all these yeah, things that we Yeah, I agree. Let me, about. maybe uh, uh, that picture. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the picture here, there's some other pictures. Let me show you the gallery. Um, so this is the supplement. So here's that picture. Um, here's another one. So, so basically, this, what, what is this scolium programming? It is kind of this lambda calculus way. So these are subroutines 
being imported. There's variables being imported. This one's a bit, oh, it can export a name or whatever, but um, but this is very much just a, a, a graphic. Uh, this is kind of a picture of your Lambda calculus thing. So why not? Yeah, it's all, it's all you know, it's all text. Actually, wait, it's all Lambda expressions. And um, yeah, there you go. So yes, another question? Hi, a uh, very interesting talk. Um, thanks. I'm just uh, interested in how difficult you find this um, and uh, how it could be used. It kind of reminds me of a Bourbaki project of like formalizing mathematics for students, uh, which subsequently put us all through a lot of pain. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, I'm wondering, like, yeah, it's so very chaotic, like the, the project, to, it's I, I feel about mathematics and learning as well that a lot of it is a it's a tacit knowledge uh, like a practical knowledge uh, kind of like you know you're learning to ride a bicycle and people like Lakoff would you know you you do build you learn mathematics by practice and I wonder if you could contrast this with uh, like how people are trying to teach students to learn mathematics by playing with this. Wow, okay, I love that. I love that question, but I could probably spend three hours talking with you in a dialogue over coffee about that. So we'll have to do that. But let me try to make a, 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 a sound bite or a series of sound bites as an answer. So um, if, you remember the, if you remember the slide where I said, well, the mathematics applications are cool, but I think the actual vehicle for this is going to be programming. Um, I think that's true, and I, I, I don't think people, I don't necessarily even think people should be studying mathematics as a separate subject. I think they should be discovering it and using it in practical problems that they're really trying to solve. So, you know, like when do you really need mathematics? Like when you're trying to build a table and you have to realize, you know, how do I get the legs to be all the same length? And wait, if I've only got four legs and the tabletop, how do I, you know, how do I structurally support it? Maybe I need a triangle or something. And what does that even mean? You know, so it's like, I think I think people should be using mathematics in a real world context, not in an artificial context. And I think uh, you might find you'd be surprised if, if in studying this kind of very formal, separate from the rest of the world way, it was studied in the course of doing programming projects. You might find people excited about mathematics. And I think the evidence already exists that that is true. So, um, you know, my background's in in that topic, but. Uh, but I, I hope that, you know, I get to do some of that and some other things and ultimately combine them. Thanks. So on that note, one of the things about mathematics is that you need different explanations at different, in different contexts, right? Is that you need to be able to explain the same concept in lots of different ways. For example, explaining addition to a five-year-old is different from explaining addition to a 25-year-old. Um, have you thought about that problem? Because clearly a dictionary of mathematics, uh, which is one of the things that you're talking about, yep. isn't particularly useful in that respect. It only addresses one audience. Ah, one but this, one is, this is why it's called the hyper-real dictionary. So it's not just a normal dictionary. So a normal dictionary, and, and dictionary might be the wrong word, but the the reason it's called hyperreal is that it's actually better than the real thing. It not only it contains all mathematics, it simulates it, and it's better. So it could explain the idea of plus or whatever addition to a five-year-old or to a 50-year-old, and it would do it in a context-appropriate way. This is a very conceptual project, of course. I mean, um, but what would that actually mean substantially? It would mean that you would want to have these different networks of things, and you say, I'm going to pull out this branch. So it's, it's one of the things that, um, that, that maybe some of these pictures have uh, is, a, so here's a classic example of a, of a semantic network, okay? Um, this is about a bird who owns a nest, and you want to do this query or, or thing to figure out who owns which nest or whatever. Um, but instead of being this, imagine you want to pull out, you know, which kinds of reading materials are relevant to my question and relevant to what kinds of knowledge you've represented about me. So if it's shown that you simply do not understand addition, or maybe you simply understand addition as long as the numbers are positive but not when they're negative, uh, it wants to, you want to pull out some examples that are suitable to you at, at that point and, and help with you at that, at that level. Um, so, you know, so yeah, a dictionary won't do. We need a hyperreal dictionary. Maybe we need a better term, um, better term to describe it. So 
I guess this actually connects to what Nick was saying. Um, uh, so I'm, at, I'm also a math student. Um, and one, one of the things I find myself doing an awful lot of the time is carefully trying to understand some you know, obscure category theory or something, right? Maybe, and Maybe this example here. There we go. Oh, that, that, that's, that's algebra, that's not too bad. But anyway, um, but, uh, so, and maybe I'll start writing a document probably in LaTeX, right? And I'll get about two pages in, and then I understand it, so I stop writing, because of course there's no point in writing any further. But um, something that would be really, really cool, and maybe actually ties in with this really nicely, is um, where I can look at either Planet Math, or more excitingly, maybe a, um, an article on archive.org or something. Sure. And I say, and I get to the bit that I was completely stuck on. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't hear you because of the noise. This oh, sorry. And I get to the bit I'm completely stuck on, and I say, yes. ah, yes, this is really confusing, but this is actually explained in page seven, or yep. consider the following paper, or this sort of thing. Is, is there a way in which you can see your project kind of linking in with that sort of annotation? Um, um, absolutely. So... So I somehow bypassed this slide in my in my talk, uh, and I don't know where I can get back to it. But basically, when I, remember when I was talking about sort of the social justice thing, and you want to annotate the web, you want to be able to say this thing is good and that thing's bad, and so forth. Well, instead of doing social justice applications, and, and you know, do we decide whether Coca Cola really murders people in South South America, or if that's just sort of you know hype or whatever? I mean, that's interesting. But what if we try to annotate page seven and say, look? You know, I mean, the classic example, and I think it was the same page seven you're thinking of. You would say, this page seven is, is actually misleading, and it's giving me the wrong idea. What you really want to read is this other treatment here, which has it exactly right. And, you know, had I known that in the first place, it would have saved me a lot of time. You want to say that for your own benefit so you can remember and to save the time of potentially hundreds of other people who are getting into this field. And you want that link to be very discoverable the next time someone goes to archive.org. So absolutely, yes, that is kind of the killer app of this, you know, to be able to do that. Or, you know, and, and if it was Coca-Cola, you would say, oh, well, gosh, you know, I really like Coca-Cola. I remember asking, this is easier than formal math, formal math, uh, formal oh, math. absolutely. This is, this is much easier. This is much easier. And if we just get this done, I'll be happy. Um, on the other hand, you know, if we get this done and, and we have this nice semi-semanticized content, it may be easier to start doing the next round. We may be, get very busy once we've got this processing things, because I think once you do that, you're going to start to learn about human heuristics, human reasoning, what people find hard and what people find interesting. And I think that that kind of stuff is kind of good enough to keep me busy for 10 years, hopefully, and enlisting some help from other people. Kind of quiet. Or Any more? No? I was going to tell you about the lunch menu, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, basically, okay, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you.